Hello and welcome to Baseball Barbacast, the only baseball podcast in the world that knows for sure that baseball is harder than cricket. I'm Jake Mintz. That's Jordan Schusterman. And if cricket was so hard, how the heck did America beat Pakistan yesterday in it? Yes, that is a, a timely way to uh, to make that claim. Um, I got to be honest, Jake. I've been really bummed that I have been too busy to not follow the T20 World Cup that is currently going on. This is an event that I have come to very much appreciate. And uh, I will say it has been very cool to see um, the John Boy, Mr. John Boy himself, just absolutely blowing the sport up for a casual audience. And I, I, I'm all in. I really like cricket. I just don't have time. I was watching Paul Skeens and Shohei Otani, which is a pretty good excuse Although I know it was a pretty big deal yesterday. Uh, this is a baseball show. We are going to talk about baseball from here on out. We are going to do our first edition of our all, All-Star Ballots, even though it is June 7th and the All-Star Game is more than a month away. We now have the opportunity to express our privilege to vote as many times as we want for, or for the most part, <laughs> for our favorite players as long as they don't pitch. Um, no don't even think about voting for a pitcher <laughs> mlb will make sure you do not do that uh, we're gonna talk about gunner henderson you had a great story go up yesterday uh, about gunner henderson and how he uh, f- fell to a pick that obviously is not reflective of his current production level we'll talk about the juan soto injury i did see paul skeens at shohei otani and yeah Good, the bad, the ugly. I'm always excited for the good, the bad, the ugly, especially after I wasn't here last week. So, Jake, uh, where would you like to begin? Should we just get right into these these here All-Stars? I'd like to begin in Maricopa County, Jordan, where much like the All-Star ballot, you can vote early and often. Five submissions allowed per day per email address. Okay, so between now and the all-star ballot closing on July gobbledygook, you could vote a whole lot. So if you're someone who looks at the American democratic process and you say, this is cool, but I only get to vote once. Well, I got good news for you. The all-star ballot is right up your alley. The structure for this is wonky. They made it a little bit more confusing than it used to be. They have two phases. Okay. Like me in high school, there are two separate phases, June 5th to June 27th. You get to, quote, help your favorites advance, right, where they uh, – a certain amount of players, I think, per position then move on to phase two, where that is June 30th. They have to qualify 3rd. for the debate. They have to qualify <laughs> for the debate. They have a, a, a base level of, of signatures that they need. Yes. Okay, Marianne Williamson <laughs> is not in – uh, we'll see. We'll see if Christian Encarnacion Strand, with his broken hand and 190 batting average, will get enough uh, support to advance yeah. to the phase two from June 30th to July 3rd, where we will officially be voting for these starters. I have to say, before we talk about specific players, as a youth, which I was once, he- heading to a baseball game in June to fill out the ballot at your seat, to poke little holes in that piece of paper is one of the more delightful baseball experiences I have. Like when I look back at my childhood, I love that feeling, right? I love that you have no stats on there. I love that it's just names, positions, teams, and vibes. Okay. Well, yeah. Go ahead. For for Theo, the 13-year-old who we answered his email last week, what are you talking about, Jake? What do you mean? Like, what? what is the action that you're referring to? Do they still Theo have has, this at games? I, I doubt it. Are you kidding me? This is, I mean, I haven't seen this since I've been working at games Dave, and going in the, but if they That's still voter did, suppression. That's maybe, voter suppression. Maybe Theo, it is. Back in the maybe day, <laughs> okay, before you kids and your generation, you were all on your phones, okay, heads in the clouds and in the cloud. We used to have to vote, you know, by hand. It's in the cloud. All right. Mm-hmm. There were hanging chads on mm-hmm. the edges of these ballots. All right. You mm-hmm. had a little like poke a pen through the little yeah. circle next to the player's so name. So satisfying though. Oh, the best. And however, that is gone. All we have is this online. My ideology when it comes to All-Star is a mix of two things. Who is having the best first half and who do I want to see celebrated? on a large stage for their accomplishments. 
And that is why I will, spoilers, be voting for Shohei Otani over Marcel Ozuna. All right. <laughs> Let us, anything else before we dive in? <laughs> no, and again, of course, you can find this ballot on LB.com. And I will say it is interesting because now they do try and help inform the voter. And we're going to go ah. position by position here. Uh, they do list, they list four stats for the hitters, obviously. No pitchers. Don't even think about voting for a pitcher. Don't we think have, about it. <laughs> we have average uh, home runs, RBIs, and OPS. Okay. Now, there's no way yeah. they would have been shown OPS on the on the on the voting, even if they had it, you know, 10, 20 years ago. But anyway, Defense? it's interesting. D- Defensive I, skills. No, we, we don't have Who D War. Them? We don't have OAA on here. Although maybe someday that'd be. Fun. I'm sure Petriello would love to have that on the ballot. Um, <laughs> but it's also two months of defensive metrics is <laughs> hilarious. So I'm glad we don't have that. But it is interesting because you know they have it listed next to every player. But then you could also sort it by that to make it really easy, right? At the top, they I don't. This seems to be new. I could be wrong, but you could just sort it by home runs and then just click the, the guy with the most home runs at each position, or you can kind of go through it, keep it alphabetical, which is what I'm going to do, and try and kind of identify. Is there any stat you would want to add on here? For me, I would oh, prefer okay. to add plate appearances or games. I think yes, yes, because right. at the top of the leaderboard, the first player you see when you sort American League first baseman by alphabetical by alphabet yes. i guess yeah. <laughs> is tristan cassis who yes. hasn't played in a month and a half right, right. and so and so he's he's sitting here at the top if you sort it by ops yeah he is at the top however if you are like a fan of the diamondbacks and you're tuning in and you haven't watched the red sox this year and you open this up and you're like oh tristan cassis he's clearly been the best first baseman I mean, Tristan Cassis is awesome. He just hasn't played very much. He's recently. played in 22 games. So so I agree. I, I would say that while I do like that these players are on the ballot, I think there should at least be a delineation and say, hey, uh, just so you know, this guy has not played in, in weeks. Wait till you see who is in American League third base. Royce yeah, so, Lewis and his okay. six games or whatever on here. We'll get to that. Let's well, I was going to say, I was gonna say uh, uh, last thing is, you have clearly, I have not even opened, what you are going to listen to me do is the first time I have looked at this page yeah. in my life. So yeah. not that I've never heard of these baseball players. I like to consider myself reasonably qualified to fill out an all-star ballot. However, yeah. Jake has given this a lot more thought than me. Um, Early this, this morning. To, to, yeah, make excuses. Said, I'm just saying we're going to have some moments here yeah. where I'm like, oh, oh, that's funny. You said to me earlier, uh, I haven't done prep for this. And I said, uh, yes, you have watched uh, so much baseball. Okay. American League. First All base. Right. Yes. My first takeaway for this category is yeah. that American League first baseman, get those numbers up. You guys are bad. Suck I know. I know. As I know. Group. Everyone, there, are every- only, there are only three players with an OPS over 800. I would say anything over 800 is pretty good. Well, this good year is fantastic. It's are you kidding me? It's, it's I'm not, saying right. in a normal year. Yes. In a normal year. There are only three players with an OPS over 800 and a reasonable amount of games. I'm going to crumble Tristan Casas up and put him somewhere else. Ryan Mountcastle, Vladimir Guerrero Jr., Josh Naylor. I think the only other player you could reasonably consider for this would be Vinny Pasquantino, who is uh, fourth in OPS. But you have players who we're used to seeing be very good, like Anthony Rizzo and Yanni Diaz, even Ty France are having down seasons. Yeah, Yanni. So it's a pretty... Yandi is a weird one. It's a pretty weak group. The funniest thing about this is that Spencer Torkelson is on the ballot mm-hmm. with his 596 OPS. He's currently playing for the Toledo Mudhens. Maybe he can make the AAA All-Star game. Jordan, who are you going to vote for? I am going to go. You know what? I think the spirit of this, like the guy who I feel like is having the best season, even though the batting average does not reflect it, is actually Josh Naylor. Uh, maybe this is me getting my, my Cleveland bias on. Uh, now that I live, you know, uh, less than an hour away from progressive field. But when I think about like, man, who's just having an all star kind of season and who's been a huge part of a very important team, which is, I guess, whatever. Um, Matt Cass has been awesome, but I'm, I'm going to vote Josh Naylor here. So I understand what you're saying. The only reason for that is home runs. So I am also inclined to vote for Naylor. And I think part of that is because he was really good earlier in the season. And so yep. he was hot and we had established that in our head. He trails Mountcastle in B-War, and he trails him in OPS+. Plus. He trails him in batting average. He trails him in OBP. He yeah. trails him in OPS. See you I, again. And yeah. the thing, well, just, I'm saying, the <laughs> thing that I, in my head, when I thought, oh, comparing these guys, well, Mountcastle, you know, probably has fewer plate appearances because he's not 
seeing facing righties every day. Not true. Yeah, he's been not true. He's been, oh, he's sorry. Been they they have basically around the same amount of plate appearances, right? Yeah. So yeah, it's similar. I think I think if you were going purely off stats to this point in the season, Mount Castle's the right pick. Sure. But it's also about vibes. And so for yeah. that reason, I'm gonna pick Josh Naylor. However, I reserve the right to change this in two weeks. Can I and can I just say also, I think a month from now, Vlad Jr. is probably gonna end up being the obvious choice. <laughs> He's yep. been awesome for, I know it's like, what do you mean? He's so disappointing. Well, actually, when the first base bar at American League is apparently this low, remember, folks, the league OPS right now is 699. So if you're over 800, you are having a fantastic season. Let's go to the National League, where we have a few more, I would say, compelling options. I think the thing that stands out here is that Matt Olson really isn't in the mix here. He has been a, a real kind of standard amongst a very loaded group in recent years, but him and Pete Alonso are are having okay seasons. Pete's having, I would say, a better season than Olsen. But to me, uh, this is Bryce Harper, and I don't think it's particularly close. Freddie Freeman, who is having a very, very good season, but it definitely ticked down from what we've seen from Freddie over the last couple of years. And Bryce has just been been marvelous in his transition to uh, to first base. So is there any I mean, do you do you feel differently? I'm, I feel pretty good about going with Bryce. Yeah, it feels like a no brainer. 14 homers, 890 OPS. I think he was the player of the month in the National League in May. I want to see Bryce Harper at yeah. the All Star game, too. Exactly. I yeah. want to give would a brief have, shot. Yeah, that would apply to Vlad, too, obviously. But, yeah. you know, that's fine. I want to give a however Josh Naylor in the home run derby would be very fun yes. I want to give a brief shout out to Lamont Wade Jr. who is having a very good and bizarre season he is a first baseman with two home runs and an 896 OPS that is hilarious and phenomenal his, he, <laughs> his OBP is like four it's something ludicrous and I know he's also being mostly platooned I believe but yeah he's got a 470 on base which in 166 plate appearances, 147 of which have come against right-handed pitching. That is an amazing season. And uh, yeah, I again, if he was the all-star starter at first base, I think a lot of fans would show up and be like, who is that? However, he is very good. Second base, American League. There are a couple of fun options here. I would say a clear top four, probably. If you want to sneak Brandon, Brandon Lau into that, you could but I won't. Michael Massey, Jose Altuve, Davis Schneider, and Marcus Semien. Michael Massey, Kansas City Royals second baseman, maybe someone not a lot of you have heard of. He's been sensational. I, this is not yeah. a player I thought was going to have this type of offensive ceiling, and it's not been lucky. Like He is legitimately hitting the ball hard and playing well and not striking out and making a lot of contact, and he's been a huge reason the Royals offense has done enough uh, to keep them in the mix in the AL Central. I'm glad you mentioned him. I'm glad you mentioned the word luck because last year, while his numbers were not great and even the expected numbers were not great, there was a huge gap. If you looked at the guys who had a biggest difference between their WOBA and their ex-WOBA last year, he was like in the top 10. And so there was kind of some underlying promising signs there that he could actually be a pretty, pretty solid, you know, middle infielder. And and yeah, again, if we're if we're reflecting, you know, the first half and someone who's been a big part of that, I think he's he's certainly deserving. I think I'm going to still go with Altuve here. He remains what, what he's been able to do amidst so much chaos on the field, off the field. He is still to me uh, an all star level player. But um, again, maybe maybe I'm being boring here and, and that's fine. I, I, I love Michael Massey. I mean, I, again, this is another one where I would love to know the the difference in, in plate appearances, which I guess I can pull up on fan graphs. I'm going to take. Michael Massey, although David Schneider from a vibes perspective. Yeah, outstanding. I'm sure Toronto would like to see him there more than Vlad Jr. <laughs> like, like at this point, maybe that's complete heresy. I feel like the the degree his approval rating is, is much higher. I think they would love Sky to see high. him rewarded. Let's move to the National League. Handful of fun ones here. Cattell Marte, Arizona Diamondbacks, Nolan Gorman, St. Louis Cardinals, Luisa Rye, San Diego Padres. And I guess a touch of the Miami Marlins. And then Bryce Terang is having a very good season for the Brewers, but the offensive numbers aren't quite there. Three weeks ago, I would have said Bryson Stott, but he fell off an offensive cliff. I think he'll get his numbers back up. He's still been about a league average hitter, so no reason to, to totally panic on him, but he's definitely not in the all-star mix. I think this has to be Cattell Marte, who has just been unbelievable yeah. for Arizona. So much has gone wrong for the Diamondbacks this year 
they've just been so slow out of the gate. But can yep. tell Marte, who was remember how good this guy was in October. He had an insane yeah. hitting streak for yeah. Arizona in the postseason. He's got 12 home runs this year, 3.4 wins above replacement on baseball reference, a 139 OPS plus. Remember, 100 is league average. He's an offensive force. He'll, you know, if he keeps this up, I think he'll finish in the top 10 for MVP. I think yeah. he has to be the starting second baseman for the National League. Although I do think Luis Arise will win this. Ooh, probably because yeah. he is more famous and he does one thing hit the ball extraordinarily well he's got a 335 batting average but i'm gonna vote for Cattell Marte. i am also gonna vote for Cattell Marte. i love Luis arise and i would love to see him in the all-star game however i'm going to take these next 20 seconds to point out that nolan gorman on may 9th his ops fell to 575 he had like an 0 for 20 stretch since then he is hitting 324, 07, 760 with 10 home runs in 22 games. He has been one of the most productive power hitters in baseball over the last month and a huge part of why the Cardinals have kind of crawled their way out of irrelevance into the messy middle of the National League. But I agree with you. Cattell Marte has been more consistent. He also, uh, for a podcast that loves Dan Ugla, is the closest thing we have in <laughs> yes. today's game to Dan Ugla. He is. Go look he at is. a picture of Nolan Gorman. He looks like two people. He, you know, he okay. is an enormous lad. <laughs> I have I mentioned this before. I saw the Cardinals last year talking with Derek Gould, the great Cardinals beat writer, and was like, he is lefty Dan Ugla. That is what he is. And he is doing that right now. We are watching a Dan Ugla-esque Homer streak uh, for Nolan Gorman. He's bigger? He's not yeah, as, I mean, he's tall. Trying to call like, Dan Ugla small? <laughs> Dan Ugla, you want these hands? <laughs> Dan Ugla, get in the weight room. Okay, let's go to the let's go to the uh, third base uh, for the American League. And now and here you- is where we run into a problem in regards to games played. Because if you sort by OPS, the first player on this list, and this is so, so funny, is Royce Lewis. Royce Lewis, who got hurt on opening day, after going two for two in that game with a home run, he has had nine plate appearances this year. He just got back off the IL during this series against the Yankees. I believe he homered in his first game back. He has three home runs on the year in nine plate appearances, and that gives him a batting line. He has a 571 batting average and a 25 24 OPS. If you are a fan, that it hasn't really been following and you somehow you know what OPS is you're like wow yeah, but the, this guy but the RBI amazing. total is a bit of a hint that uh he probably hasn't played very many games i would also say this is i i'm actually going to say this this is a top spot for mlb because yes. if this like if you don't put Royce Lewis on the ballot people are losing their mind you know but if you're committed to including the stats for all these players and not and not saying how many plate appearances they have, which again I don't understand why you don't do that. Like that's it's not a hard thing to add. Um, Michael Massey, by the way, 110 plate appearances, which is like less than half of Altuve. So I feel better about that. But uh, this is just so funny to, to look at it. Right again, when you just see the 25, 24 OPS with no other context, is <laughs> is just delightful. <laughs> However, if we're sticking with OPS. Um, man, Devers this has is a been tough amazing. Spot. This is really hard because the three the three main candidates here. You have Isak Paredes, who's basically been the only race hitter that has been hitting. He is a marvel. He is the kind of guy who, oh well, how is he doing this? He doesn't hit the ball that hard. Well, look at the guy right above him, Jose Ramirez, has been making a whole career out of that. Obviously, I believe Jose Ramirez is better than Isak Paredes, and I believe that he is deserving of being the All Star starter at uh, at third base. However, Rafael Devers is like one of you, as you know, has long been one of my favorite players. And while man, okay, so this is an amazing thing here. Again, how much should we care about RBIs? But <laughs> Ramirez, Ramirez's Ramirez has RBI total nearly is incredible, nearly double uh, what Devers has in what I assume is basically the same amount of playing time because they both pretty much play every day. I guess Ramirez has gotten. 40 more plate appearances, but this is really hard. I'm going to go with Jose Ramirez, but it, it breaks my heart because I do think that Devers is doing Devers things. He is as, as, as reliable as it gets in terms of, you know, some of the best hitters in the American league. I love him dearly, but this feels like a year of Jose. And so I'm going to give, I'm going to give him the nod. I agree. We talked about that with foolish baseball when he was on the pod. This should be the year of Jose Ramirez. I want him to start the all-star game. Yes. And Jordan, if I could really pick, I would have Jose Ramirez play second base 
for the yes. all-star team. Did you know that for his first three seasons in the major I leagues, did. Jose Ramirez yeah. played more second base than third base. In 2014, he started 54 games at shortstop. Yes, that's what he was. That's team back uh, back when back when Jose Ramirez was like this, you know, this scrappy utility guy. Ah, oh, he could play. He could play anywhere in the infield, and he'll put the ball in play, and he'll run really hard and really. It's like, oh, he's like, oh, really? Is that all I am? Uh, that's interesting. It? Watch this. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Jose, I'm going to vote for Jose Ramirez as well. So so far in the American League. Only the AL Central for me. Josh Naylor, Michael Massey, and Jose Ramirez. That is hilarious. Okay, let's move to the National League third baseman. I am going to vote for Alec Bohm. He's cooled off a little bit in the last couple of weeks, but to me, he feels like the all-star third baseman. Yeah. You know, some people listen to us be like, oh, you, you mad about Joey Ortiz, bro? Because <laughs> Joey Ortiz, 186 plate appearances. So, you know... It's not quite full time player. Um, obviously, has has had some some nice, I believe, some decent amount of platooning as well. He has been fantastic. He has been fantastic defensively. Am I going to vote for him? I kind of want to, just because I've gone pretty chalky so far, and I feel like to have a Brewers rep here feels right. I think Ryan McMahon has also been been marvelous, and I kind of do want to reward Brian McMahon for somehow getting better this year after being the exact same player for the last five seasons. I'll just go Which, Jory Ortiz. Let's have, let's have some fun. That argument you just made about Ryan McMahon would be my argument for Alec Bohm. <laughs> Like, uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, that's a good, I, that's fair. It's true. Right. But boom, we're talking about Jordan. two Jordan. seasons. Yeah. Jordan. I like Ryan McMahon. He cannot start the all-star game. <laughs> Let the Rockies have something. Okay. He can't Ryan McMahon has five seasons of being basically the same player. And then now this year, he's like, well, above average. Anyway, that's fine with me. I'm going with Jory Ortiz though. I got to give, I got to give the brew crew some love. And he has been an, an outstanding addition. The, I'm going to vote for bump. The notable thing about this category is just the number of players we're used to seeing be really good being not very good. Austin Riley. I know he's battled with uh, injuries this year, but he's, his numbers are nowhere near. Same thing with Manny Machado. His numbers are bad. Nolan Arenado. His numbers are not very good. Matt Chapman has turned it on a little bit more lately, but when you look at the top of this list, it's certainly not the names. You would expect Max Muncy has missed a bunch of time on the shelf yeah. for an injury. Yeah, I was going to say, Muncy was looking pretty good. Um, and if he had not gotten hurt, I think his power numbers might have been too overwhelming here to yeah. ignore. But I'm going to go with, uh, with Joey Ortiz. I'm going to go with Bum. The, the extent to which I want to vote for Christopher Morel, I mean, his numbers are not there, <laughs> but just from an energy perspective, that dude is yes. awesome. Get hot, Christopher Morrell. We'll vote for you in a couple weeks. Uh, uh, American okay. League shortstop Jordan now Schusterman. Nitty gritty time. I mean, nitty I'm gritty gonna time, for, Jake Mintz. I'm going to vote for Gunnar Henderson over Bobby Wood Jr. You can. Okay. Here, I, this is the thing. I am, you I can am vote not for going either to do guy. That. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> you can vote for either guy. There, there yeah. maybe you could. These might be two of the five best players in the world right now yeah. over the last two yeah. months to start the season. Henderson has a 951 OPS. Bobby Witt has a 931 OPS. Uh, Bobby Witt is hitting 317, which is incredible. He's also been, you know, more dynamic than Gunner on the bases. And it, even though Gunner is a very good base runner mm -hmm. and a better defender, correct? I mean, you cannot go wrong. Like these are yep. both correct decisions. Yep. Again, yep. one of them should just play second base. In this case, uh, yeah, right. I Especially here, or we move, you know, Ramirez to second, and we just put Gunner at third. Gunner at third. That feels that feels that feels like the answer uh, in the American League. I'm going to go with Bobby Witt. We're going to talk about Gunner Henderson a little bit after. So let's this listen. They're amazing. Let's move on. Um, uh, wait, one second, Anthony Volpe. Great job, Zach Neto. Yeah, well, you're fine, right. Paul Correa, DeYoung. You're Correa gonna, having a pretty great, great season. You know. Um, Go look at Henderson and Witt. So, it's a different so level. Also, by the way, what we just talked about with the National League third baseman. Oh, my gosh. Boba shit. Oh, my gosh. Boba shit. All right. Uh, let's go to the National League shortstop. Where bad news, everybody. Mookie Betts is playing shortstop now. Uh, great news for the Dodgers as they have asked a lot of him. And last night, I did not stay for the game last night in Pittsburgh. But it was like Mookie was like, oh, right. Okay. This is this is what it's a little bit easier facing Billy Falter than facing. Paul Skins and Jared Jones and Mookie Betts will always hit. Dave Roberts had a bit of a sassy answer. 
understandably, before the game where everyone's like, oh, is he not hitting because he's focusing too much on shortstop? And he's like, that's what everybody wants it to be, but I don't think that's what it is. Mookie will eventually hit. He had a huge game last night, and he is the answer here. Uh, I know Ellie, of course, is going to be in the get a lot of votes as he deserves to, for sure. And I would love to see Ellie De La Cruz start the All-Star game. However, my brain and my glasses are looking at this, these numbers, and I'm going to vote for Mookie Betts, uh, who is playing shortstop at the major league level every yeah. day <laughs> because his team really needs him to for some reason. Ellie De La Cruz is a million things. One of those things is not better than Mookie Betts right now. And that's okay. That's fine. He's, you know, a child. But and and Ellie De La Cruz will get in as a alternate or not an he alternate. Will, He'll get in he as will a start an all star game sometime. He will be fine. Maybe even still this year. I would maybe say maybe even this year. Maybe even still this year. But the Mookie Betts, yeah, I got to vote for Mookie Betts. He just he's so good. The only other player I think I want to shout out is Willie Thomas, who I think will probably get in as a bench guy. All right, let's move to catcher in the American League surprisingly robust assortment of baseball players wearing catcher's gear in the American League. Salvador Perez, Ryan Jeffers, Adley Rushman, Danny Jansen, even throw Connor Wong in there if you're feeling spry. I Salve. think not, I'm not a question for, for me. Salvador Perez. So. Not even a question. Um, he's amazing. I've expressed my adoration for him. Many times on this here podcast, and uh, yeah, the fact that we assumed ah, I'd fall off eventually, 890 OPS as a catcher for one of the better teams in the American League is is outstanding. Sure, maybe he is not the overall catcher or player that, that Adley Rutschman is. Uh, that's fine, but I think if Salvi is just, as long as he's playing like this, I would like to reward him. I am voting for Salvi. I totally understand if someone voted for Al, uh, for Adley instead. Jeffers has been great. Maybe he gets in as a bench guy. He's really been impressive. Uh, National League, William Contreras. Yep, yep. I mean, Wilson Contreras, by the way, was just absolutely tearing it up before his arm was broken by J.D. Martinez's bat. Will Smith has been very boring and very good. And so I'm going to go with William Contreras, who has been very not boring and very good. One gripe about the ballot here. The Braves rep on here is Sean Murphy and not Travis Darno. I that's a tough spot because they split so much time. But Murphy had missed an extended period, and Darno is essentially the everyday catcher during that span. If there is a way you can get both of them in, that would be great. Murphy literally does he just hasn't gotten back going. He doesn't have a home run yet. Uh, just something to keep an eye on there. But yeah, I I think that it's easily William Contreras. He is, in my opinion elevating himself into the best catcher in baseball. Let's move to the outfield. The American League, this is the easiest one. This is the easiest selection is the three American League outfielders. It is yep. Aaron Judge, it is Juan Soto, and it is Kyle Tucker. I think who's your, who's your four? Kwan, yeah. I think if Stephen Kwan had stayed healthy and not gone on the aisle and missed that time, he would have been my fourth pick. But I think it is an easy top three between those three guys. I it's like agree. not even close. It's not even close. Like Judge and Soto have OPSs over a thousand. Tucker's yeah. at nine seventy nine right and nineteen no one homers else is particularly close. Yeah, to I I agree. I don't even think this this is kind of like the shortstop one where it's like, yep, it's these guys, and we can uh, can move on from there. And yes, we will we will talk about Juan Soto here in a second. But I I agree. I'm I'm I have no no notes no notes. I think if Quan had stayed healthy and played every day and was hitting three fifty. You know, maybe you could make an argument that, but I would <laughs> still be very difficult to argue that over these other three guys. Tommy Pham? Uh, prob probably not. Uh, let's go okay. to the National League, where again, if you <laughs> sort by OPS and don't care about uh, plate appearances, you will end up with a gentleman named. Helio Ramos. Uh, am I? I always struggle with this pronunciation. I, I got. I got to get this one right. Because again, I, he was like off my radar as far as like part of the Giants. Uh, oh, it is. It is just Elliot. Elliot or Elliot Ra uh, Ramos, which is uh, always that throw, throws me off. Puerto Rican born Elliot Ramos, twenty four year old outfielder this year, one hundred and eight plate appearances. So not nothing, but he is hitting three hundred four, four hundred seven, five eleven. Does that mean he is going to be starting in the outfield for me in in uh, in this All Star game? I will say 
there's not as many options that I'm particularly excited about. But am I going to vote for him? Probably not. Christian Yelich returning to this level is pretty exciting. I mean, Jake Mintz, when did Christian Yelich last make an all-star? He has not been an all-star since 2019. And here he is. Now, he's also been injured. He's also only played in 36 games, but he's rocking an OPS over 900, which is difficult to ignore. So I'm compelled to give Yelich at least one of these spots. But what uh, what else stands out for you here? Because there's not a Fernando, lot of great choices. Fernando Tatis Jr. is getting one of my three. That is yeah. the first, yeah. I think. No, I, I guess he's really me. the only obvious one. Just he's so dynamic. He's the type of player I want to see in the All-Star game. We know he's really good. Um, we that's what we want. And didn't he not make it last year as kind of a you are punished uh, right. for being yes, a dummy? Yes, I do. Yes, that is correct. They were like, "Sorry, bro, this is like a part of your suspension is you don't get to go to the All Star game, even though you've been right. really good." Exactly. <laughs> he, He's like, he got "Oh no, glove. I don't have to." Yep. Yeah, you got to go glove. You got MVP votes, but yeah, he was not not invited uh, to to the All Star game. So I'm gonna give Tatis one of my votes. I really want to give Rocky center fielder Brenton Doyle a vote because he was like the worst offensive player ever last year. And now he's totally average and also an elite defender. But I can't justify that. I'm going to vote for Teoscar Hernandez with the Dodgers because I think his offensive production has been really good. And he's on the Dodgers and the Dodgers are good. I wish I could just put Mookie out here. That would be my real pick. I think I'm going to go Yelich. To Oscar and Fernando Tatis. I know Jerks and Profar technically has the most war of any National League outfielder, but I'm not in a position where I can do that. I just I'm I am maybe I'm being a hater. I am a hundred percent voting for Profar, and here's why. Um, <laughs> he's lead. He's played in every game. He's okay. leading the league and on base. Yep. And when we started this whole thing, Jake Mintz, all we wanted to do was talk about Jerks and Profar. Yeah, right. That's just like why we became friends. And why was it? Because this jerks and profile guy, he's going to be an all star level player for the next 10 years. And Jake, how many all star games does jerks and profile made? <laughs> Nil. <laughs> Zippity doo da. If not now, when? I mean, my gosh, he has yeah. been like, what do we yeah. want him to do? Like, this is, yeah. he's played every, it's inexplicable. He's clearly more comfortable in, in San Diego. If if it's not happening this year, it's never happening. So, Jerks and Profar, you will join your teammate Fernando Tatis with Christian so, Yelich in that's my what's very funny Brewers to me. centric uh, All Star team. I was gonna say it's a very, it's very funny to me because it's Profar and t- two Padres in the All Star outfield feels wonky considering what they've been this year. <laughs> yes. I also, but again, this is just such a weak group. When you go down the list, right? So bad. Elliot Ramos. <laughs> Really hasn't played too much. His BABIP yeah. is like just Nimmo. If we go by war, like Nimmo is in there, but it doesn't feel right. like he's been like at an all star level. Jason Hayward is up on the OPS leaderboard. He missed a lot of time. Conforto missed some time. Suzuki missed some time. Brandon Marsh is hurt right now. Bellinger missed time. Spencer Steer missed time. TJ Friedel missed time. Like Talkman has been really good. And by the way, here's another part about this, right? You already mentioned one of them. Mookie goes to short and Acuna's out. So like those two have just been like, okay, those two. All right. We just have those as our, as our Corbin Carroll has been, but that's another huge one that we would have assumed would have been in the mix here this year. So Bellinger, not quite good enough. Um, some of those other Cubs guys, right. Uh, you know, Michael Harris hasn't really taken quite that step. So obviously not offensively bad. Yeah. Yeah. Say Suzuki, say Suzuki. This is an okay pick, but not, not really there. Fine. So. You've convinced me. I don't know uh, who's playing yeah. center field in this outfield between <laughs> Fernando Tatis Jr., Christian Yelich, Jerks, and Profar, but hey, who cares? That's the National League pitching staff's problem, not mine. Uh, all right. Let's move to Daya DH and wrap this up before we take a break. Um, okay. We, sorry. Let's just do National League. We're both – listen, Ozuna, he's – guess you could say he has been better than Shohei Otani. I don't really care at all. I'm voting Shohei Otani for the All-Star game, and that is my National League pick. Let's talk about the American League. I assume you agree with me on that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's talk about... It's fine. Braves fans, if you want to be mad, that's fine. All right. American League. Oh, no. Braves fans are mad at me? <laughs> okay. uh, let's what am I going to do? Let's move on to the American League. This is much more interesting. I Wait, just time out. I do want to say, I do feel we are not voting for any Braves. I don't. 
like they've been they haven't been no one has has emerged as like yeah i'm one of the best hitters in the league like except for ozuna sorry and i except for ozuna and i just explained otani's otani so yeah (laughs) i yeah travis derno has the second highest ops plus on the team behind ozuna their offense has been bad they will have how many pitchers maybe three Pitchers, someone's uh, going to get voted in, man. I mean, I, they might. The, the, who yeah. knows? The fans but might sale, get a, a Cunha out there on 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 crutches and a wheelchair. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Sale and Lopez will probably both make it. I would imagine Sale for sure. Yeah, uh, Rysel Iglesias might make it in the pen. So, like, there will be Braves. Ozuna will probably yes. make it as a as a sub. If I had, if I had to guess, so yeah, Braves. There will be Braves but not in the starting lineup. Okay, DH and the AL is super freaking weird. I mean, okay, so this is one where <laughs> you have David Fry with his uh, 1075 OPS and not not no play. To, I mean, he's he's playing. He's 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 playing baseball. He's their three hitter often, which is which is pretty wild. Although what let's see how many plate appearances is he? Oh, oh, but here's the other thing about him. He, he has started has a, four games as the designated hitter. That's that's the thing. They have clearly forced David Fry in here instead of other places. He's bounced so, around. He's caught. He's played left. He's played a little bit of infield. So what do we do with this? Right. He's played eight. He, this is just his starts by position. Eight at catcher. Eight at left field. Four at first base. Or sorry, four at DH. Eight at first base. So it's it's wonky. It's weird, right? It's kind of tough to get him in. So I'm fine with this, I guess. I would prefer I don't know. It's so bizarre. So if we're going just like enough playing time and you know OPS or WRC plus whatever, it's Brent Rooker. You I know, agree. like like it's it's Brent Rooker and we know he was an all-star last year. We know he kind of fell off in the second half, but he's been awesome. He's there's really not a lot you can kind of poke holes in here and you know you could say that Jordan has been good enough to where you kind of default to him but he's also been below his his standard he's been good but he's been below his standard Ryan O'Hearn is another one that's another platoon situation where it's like he's been awesome and if you pull up that savant page it sure looks like an all-star do you account for the for the uh for the platoon stuff Kerry Carpenter is another one, only 163 plate appearances, but he has been very, very productive when he has played. He's kind of in that, you know, with, with Isak Paredes as far as one of the only guys that's actually hitting on his team. I don't know. I mean, we have Josh Young here with his 14-15 OPS in what I assume is like five games. <laughs> so that doesn't really count for me. Well, where do you where do you lean here? I think I have to go Rooker, and I don't I don't really feel bad about it. What do you think? I love I... David Fry, but it's I, he's not a DH, so. I am leaning towards David Fry as a holy crap, look at what you've accomplished. <laughs> yeah. I love yeah, that fair. you are this. I understand Brent Rooker. I have no problem with that. I think I am going to lean. You know what? Yeah, I'm going to go with David Fry. Let's live a little. Right. So that's my ballot. Right. I'm done, Jordan. Can I read it out? All to right, you? That's good. Can I read you, it out? That, please. Yes. Josh Naylor, first base. Michael Massey at second. Actually, you know what? I'm changing that. I'm going to change that to Jose Altuve. He doesn't have enough plate appearances. You're right. You're right about that. I'm not right about anything. We're just we're just clicking buttons on a, on a screen. <laughs> Call me a coward. All right. Josh Naylor at first. Jose Altuve at second. Jose Ramirez at third. Gunnar Henderson at shortstop. Salvi behind the dish. Judge, Soto, and Tucker in the outfield. Easiest part. David Fry as my DH, even though he's only DH four times. In the NL, Bryce Harper. Ketel Marte, Alec Bohm at third. Mookie Betts is playing shortstop now. Uh, Will- William Contreras behind the dish. Yelich, Tatis, and Jerickson Profar in the outfield. And Shohei Otani as the DH. Uh, my ballot is like 90% the same, except I have Bobby Witt Jr. over Gunnar Henderson. I have Brent Rooker over David Fry. I have Joey Ortiz over Alec Bohm. And I have, uh, no, I think that's it. I think those are the only ones we are remotely disagreeing on. And hopefully you enjoyed that first look at the all-star ballot here on June 7th. It is way too early to be making these decisions, but Jordan, I am just doing my job. What about the pitchers? Uh, I don't know. I've never heard. I don't, I don't know any. I can't name any pitchers. So, okay. They don't have OPSs and RBI totals and home runs. So 
Shohei they mean does. nothing to me. Shohei is not a pitcher. So what? I have nothing. Shohei has actually pitched less uh, recently than probably than some David of these other Fry. guys. Uh, <laughs> David Fry pitched last year. I don't think. Oh, well, he might have pitched this year, actually. <laughs> has David Fry pitched an inning this season? He has uh, not. We, he has not. I know he definitely pitched last year at some point. One second. Um, Just stay on the line. Yeah. Shohei Otani's final pitching appearance mm-hmm. in 2023 came yep. on August 23rd. David Against Fry's final pitching right. appearance in 2023 came on September 4th. So David Fry <laughs> has pitched more recently than Shohei Otani. Exactly. All right. Those are our all star ballots. We're going to take a break. And when we get back, <laughs> we are going to zoom through some maybe important news, uh, give you the good, the bad, the ugly, and say have a good weekend. And welcome back to Baseball Barbacast. Jake Mintz, Jordan Schusterman. Jordan, how is your forearm, your left forearm? My left forearm is fine. My right forearm is also fine. So thank you for clarifying which forearm, but I'm doing okay. My left forearm is okay. However, there is a very important baseball player whose left forearm is is apparently not doing okay. And that's Juan Soto. Uh, this was, I was driving back from Pittsburgh last night as this story was sort of developing. And it seems that the Juan Soto spoke to the media ve- like very late. It was like close to close to midnight, I believe, that that Soto officially spoke and Aaron Boone spoke. Can you run me through the latest on on this situation? So I was not there at the game last night because I'm bad at my job. Mm-hmm. But people the are saying, Yankees yeah. and Twins, yeah, people are saying, Yankees and Twins had a rain delay, an extended rain delay. And when uh, the rain delay, I believe it was 56 minutes, uh, when the rain delay uh, returned from its raining delay, Juan Soto was not around town Uh, he was taken out in the top of the sixth when the game resumed and everyone was like oh my god what's going on and when asked about it afterwards aaron boone said that uh soto had been dealing with soreness in his left forearm for one to two weeks and this is in the mlb.com article written by friend of the show matthew ritchie during the rain delay soto and team physician chris ahmad who did my tommy john uh humble brag decided that it was best to pull him from the game out of caution. He will undergo further imaging on Friday. Soto said, quote, we all decided not to start getting warmed up again after sitting down here in the clubhouse after an hour. We didn't want to risk anything like that, so we just decided to stop. Panic level, uh, for me, not that high. For Yankees fans, should be astronomical. The imaging (laughs) will tell the story. You seem to be more of a worry wart than me. Yeah, and you know, part of this is just kind of covering our ass for when the imaging reveals he's you know not playing until twenty twenty nine or whatever. Uh, it's obviously, being dramatic, I will say it feels very familiar to how this went with uh, Jason Dominguez last year. Although I will say that um, Soto's quotes are a little bit different. It seems like again, there's not really pain when he's actively doing anything it's just kind of lingering and it has been lingering for at least a week plus now to the point where they've decided we need to get this checked out this is i i mean i don't even want to say anything else because we will get a diagnosis and we will understand how big of a deal this is obviously we wish we had that information as we recorded this on friday morning otherwise uh there's a good chance we'll be talking about it on monday one way or the other so i think we can just table it here and hope that it is not as bad as we fear. And if it is, if he has serious, you know, issues with the elbow, of course, there'll be conversations about <laughs> if he should continue playing or not. That is going to be very messy, whatever. Um, but that's it is, of course, it's Juan Soto. It is it is a big deal. If he's been dealing with this for the last two weeks, uh, over the last two weeks, he has a 249 WRC plus. He has hit yeah. four home runs. He has been mm-hmm. worth one win above replacement. He has been Juan Soto over the last one to two weeks. And so even if this is an issue that gives him pain, it does feel like something that it is something that he has successfully played through yes. already. And yes. I do think that is worth understanding. Totally agree with that. Yeah, it, no. it, it would be a different story if Soto's numbers over the last two weeks had mm-hmm. fallen off a cliff. But that's mm-hmm. not what we're dealing with. Mm-hmm. No, I definitely agree with that. So let's just cut it here and we will hopefully have an update later today and we will talk about it uh, next week. Jake, you had a story go up yesterday about Gunnar Henderson. Gunnar Henderson 
as we mentioned earlier in our all-star conversation, has been one of the best players in baseball this year. He, of course, the defending rookie of the year has now immediately transitioned to the MVP conversation. And for those of us familiarizing ourselves with Gunnar Henderson this season in a more meaningful way, and maybe this happened last year when it was like, wow, this guy, you know, second rounder, 42nd overall, he's one of the best players in baseball. He was last year. And now he finished eighth in MVP last year. You know, this is a guy that was already sort of getting some down ballot votes last year. Now he is on pace for a truly ridiculous season. Last year, he was a 6.2 uh, baseball reference war player. He is already at 4.3 this year in 61 games. So he is heading for one of the better seasons we've seen from a shortstop this century. And you kind of wrote about what went into his his draft status, why he ended up going 42nd overall. I enjoyed the story, of course, as a draft dork. But what were your biggest takeaways kind of reporting the story out? For me, it was just kind of understanding the mechanisms and the dynamics at play when a player like Henderson falls to 42nd overall, the first pick of the second round of the draft in 2019. Because there are many players who are drafted later in the draft who end up having incredibly successful MLB careers. But what is unique about Henderson is how quickly he got this good. And usually when players get this good this quickly, they are taken at the top of the draft because their skill set at 17 and 23, like, yes, there's a ton of physical and baseball development that happens, but the gap is smaller, right? And so I went back and looked at players age 23 or younger who have put up seven and a half win seasons and looking at when they were drafted. And it's the list you would expect, right? It's Cody Bellinger, it's Mookie Betts, it's Bryce Harper, it's Manny Machado, it's Mike Trout, Albert Pujols, Alex Rodriguez, Ken Griffey. And what stands out about Henderson is that he was a second round pick. Bellinger, I believe, was a fourth round pick. Betts, I believe, was also uh, a, Betts was a fifth round pick. But you have, it's just an interesting dynamic. How did this happen this quickly where literally every team, except the Red Sox, who did not pick before Gunnar was taken, the Red Sox, you're off the hook. How did every team pass on this guy, right? What allowed that to happen? And the sense that I got in reporting the story out is Gunnar was a very talented, though very raw high school player. And teams are wary of drafting high school players. There were problems with the profile, and by that I mean a high school hitter, and there were problems with Gunner as a player, and those problems were teams doubted whether he was going to stick at shortstop, and if he had to move down the defensive spectrum, would he have the bat-to-ball skills necessary to make the most of his power? And so because of those concerns, he fell a little bit further than you would expect a player who might win the MVP to fall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say I think the nugget you kind of had in here about how um, only one high school hitter taken between 2013 and 2018 given a bonus of over two and a half million. I know that sounds like kind of weird, arbitrary lines, but like that's a lot of players. That's a lot of players who have been given a big bonus in that high at the top of the draft as a high school bat that have not worked out. Really, the only guy that you mentioned has definitively worked out is Kyle Tucker. Royce Lewis, maybe if he can stay healthy, but that's what's so interesting. And, and as someone who's followed the draft really closely over the last five years, high school players and high school pitchers are a different conversation. But if we focus on high school hitters, they are the ones who will very quickly either burn you or make you look like a genius. And that's the thing. It's just really hard to know how good these players really are. When you have players with three years of college competition, obviously those guys sometimes bust or, or, or break out in ways that that you don't necessarily expect, but you have a lot more information. With high schoolers, even with all the showcase data we have now, it is so hard to know. And that's why you have so many stories now where it's like, oh, I think about a guy like Aiden Miller, who the Phillies took this year, who was later in the first round, was very w- well well regarded you know, as, a, as an amateur, but it, it, teams kind of fell off him. And then suddenly he gets into pro ball. And within, a, you know, within weeks... We have teams seeing him on the back. It's like, oh, we're idiots. Like, he's awesome. You know, like, and that's, or the opposite happens. Or it's like, oh, this guy's awesome. This guy's awesome. He gets into pro ball and he immediately falls on his face because pro ball is different than high school ball at any level. And so Gunnar Henderson is, of course, a pretty extreme example of everything going right with the development and with the talent uh, in in play. I think of a guy like Austin Beck, right, who the Oakland A's took sixth overall in 2017 and gave $5.3 million, a high school hitter from North Carolina. And the industry knew almost immediately, seeing him against pro competition, that it was not going to work. And it's just because the gap between, you know, blah, blah, Eastern high and 
pro pitching is enormous. <laughs> yeah. and, and like, you know, the 18 year old Dominican who just got to the complex and is throwing 99. <laughs> who's Versus like, like some guy who has a math test tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Who's who's not even really that much of a prospect. That's just what pro baseball is now. Like that tells you a lot. And there's again, I'm not just going to I mean, I could, of course, name a ton of examples. I'm not just going to start burying kids and saying, look, this guy sucked. This guy sucked. But go ahead. Go pull up baseball reference draft page and you go and look at the number of high school hitters taken in the first round who barely made it to double a or couldn't even make it double a versus the ones who were picked in the later half of the first round because teams were scared to take them in the top 10 or in the top five or in the top 20 even that did immediately turn in to super duper top prospects there's there's of course the draft is hard at all levels and all demographics but i think that that is the big takeaway here and, and gunner is, is a pretty astonishing uh, version of that Right. And I think the Orioles, what's important to understand, the Orioles really liked Gunner at the time. What he has become surpasses even their wildest dreams about who they thought he could be when they picked him. They were like, oh, big power, swing and miss, third baseman. Instead, he developed more than enough bat to ball skills to be a elite hitter, and he stayed kind of athletic and skinny enough to be a shortstop, right? And both of those things uh, have propelled him to what he is right now. I, in the article, right, I, I kind of go through why some of these specific teams passed on him. And I think the Pirates are the team that probably it's toughest to swallow because they picked a different high school hitter ahead, right ahead of Gunnar Henderson, a kid named Sam Isiani, who's actually been pretty good this year for them in double A. But it's just, it's tough because you look at the demographic and the Pirates were comfortable with that type of hitter, that type of player. They just picked the wrong one, right? And it's worth noting that a lot of the people who made that decision for the Pirates are no longer working for the Pirates. Well, that that uh, that's another part of this, right? Like scouting circles and scouting front offices are shuffling all the time. And, and, yeah. and there's always going to be, <laughs> this happens at every sport. Everyone's, oh, we were going to take Giannis. We were going to take Jokic. And, uh, you know, I just couldn't get my guy to do it. So there's versions of that, I'm sure. Um, but I did right. really appreciate the the insight you got kind of talking to some people that were involved in those decisions. Yeah, I got a little bit of that from from Philly's world. Mm -hmm. We really liked him. But, you know, the, the, if the Phillies had taken Gunnar Henderson at 14th overall, mm -hmm. people would have been like, what are you doing? Right. Mm -hmm. That's the thing, right? And, and they they that's, a, that's part of the dynamic where you, if you, you got to take those risks to get those rewards, a lot of times it's uh, it's a little bit harder to take that swing. Uh, all right, Jake. Let's move on. I'm. I'll keep this brief. Uh, I saw Paul Skeens against Shohei Otani. It was. It was so freaking cool. I think what the Pirates have now going right now with Jones and Skeens, and Mitch Keller. Here's a funny. I'll just give this little <laughs> nugget, just to kind of. This is a funny way to tell why it's cool to see Jones and Skeens. I run into Mitch Keller in the tunnel. Friend of the show, uh, future guest, great guy. Obviously, Mitch Keller. Just been been good. He's he's been with the Pirates for a longer opening day starter. We we love Mitch Keller. The right? Pride of Cedar Rapids, just chilling. Exactly. Uh Mitch Keller, who throws pretty hard. You know, Mitch Keller. I and I see him. I'm like, man, you're you're kind of a soft tosser now, man. Like your four seamer average is 94.5. He's like, yeah, man, I'm <laughs> I'm just kind of getting it in there. You know, I'm I'm a thumber now, as they call <laughs> as they call it. <laughs> because Jones and Skeens are coming out sitting 99. But the, the Skeens and Otani stuff was was obviously fantastic. Jones is is it was even better against the Dodgers on Tuesday, but the energy in the ballpark for Skeens is is certainly unmatched. And uh, and they're just, just really excited. And then it's just to, as long as they're gonna be back to back in the rotation, they, it is going to be must watch TV. And I know the Dodgers were really scuffling <laughs> until until last night, and they are definitely having some issues on offense, but Skeens delivered. It was cool to see him both dominate and kind of work through some trouble in the fifth and uh, find a way to kind of get as deep into the game as possible. But yeah, he's he's must watch, man. And he's I it's and Jen Jones is, too. So the Pirates have have, they, they, you know, they they're not a great team yet, but they definitely have some very, very exciting, exciting building blocks. All right, let's boot up the good, the bad and the ugly. We have kept you people and your ears captive for long enough and we will dive right in to the goodness. One thing good, one thing bad, and one thing bizarre. Dan, Ugla Jordan, I'm going to kick you the rock. My good this week are the two national champions we got yesterday. The Misericordia Cougars at the Division Three baseball level. 
A year ago, Jake, you wrote about this team because they got hit by more pitchers than any college baseball team in America. They did it again this year, and they won it all. However, if you're hearing that, oh, this is a joke, this is a circus. No, this team is as gritty as it gets. Every possible cliche about the grinder type, t- this is Misericordia, and they have done it. They have finally reached the mountaintop. They defeated the evil empire of D3 sports, Whitewater that we talked about who eliminated Birmingham Southern, and I'm so happy for the Misericordia program to finally lift the trophy. So shouts out to them. We'll talk about more about them another time. On the flip side, <laughs> there's the Oklahoma Sooners who captured their fourth straight national championship last night at the Division I softball level. And this class of seniors, Kinsey Hansen, Nicole May, Riley Boone, uh, uh, who was, oh, Jada Coleman. This is a, the, a GOAT class of any sport in any level. Is this just unbelievable. Kinsey Hansen, one of my favorite athletes of the last half decade. And they are un- unbelievable. This is We are witnessing greatness with this team, and I'm sure it's tiring for softball fans to see the same team win every year, but they did lose seven whole games this year, and they got through it with some great transfers, some great freshmen, and uh, but those seniors are finally moving on, and I'm very excited to see how they reload for 2025. Shouts out to Ella Parker, their freshman star, who is the niece of Dave Roberts, and that was another cool thing I saw this week is when they came back and beat Florida on a walk-off, Dave Roberts was like locked in during BP. He was very, very, very excited about that, so um, shouts out to the Sooners because they are as, as as good as it gets uh, at at this at this level. Never lost. Uh, I think multiple things are true. The Sooners. It is both them winning ev- the last four seasons has been an unbelievable accomplishment and has made me less intrigued to watch <laughs> the World Series. Like watch is, the games. Sure. Yes. I I, I watch, I definitely I watch the that. highlights, but like I just yes. It's like, oh, well, Oklahoma won. This year, it was much more dramatic. T.R.A. Jennings, by the way, obviously the last senior yeah. uh, I forgot there. But um, yeah, they are. I, I'm so impressed. And as a huge softball fan, I am. Uh, yeah, well, I, I get what you're saying. It is. I, I feel I feel lucky to be very aware and watching something this yeah. special and be able to, you know, tell my my kids like, hey, yeah, there was a softball team and they just won every year. And it was the they only won. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. What's your good this week? Uh, very simple. There is a minor league baseball player named Chandler Simpson mm-hmm. who is having a very, very bizarre season. He is a uh, infield prospect for the Tampa Bay Rays. He has been in high A and a double A. He does not have a home run, so he must suck. Wrong, wrong. He's hitting. I love 366. Chandler Simpson so much. He's hitting three sixty six and has stolen forty five bases. He has one triple and two doubles. Okay, he has one oh triple and two doubles. He has three extra base hits. All What's season. the line? He- What's the line? The batting line on him, on Chandler Simpson. Oh, no, I have to pull it up. Sorry, give me one second. I was <laughs> Chandler Simpson, just so you know, he is a, I don't even know what position, I guess he's, I don't know what position he's been playing. He played some infield, he's played some outfield. Georgia Tech, just one of the fastest players I've ever seen in, in my life. And he he is, I mean, I think there is a chance he is the fastest baseball player in organized baseball. I think, I think it's actually a very good chance he is. I believe he's the qualified leader in batting average in the minor leagues at all levels. Yeah. He is hitting 366, 417. All right, good. 804. Or sorry, 387. 804 is his OPS. 366, 386. 417, 387 slug. Again, that's one triple and two doubles, but he has stolen just an absolute whole oh. host of bases. He is leading the minor leagues in steals. Hey, so Ray, call him season. up. I, I, You have not been fun to watch this season. I would love to watch Chandler Simpson, even if he probably won't hit 360 at the major league level, at least not this year. My bad this week, Jake, is just the National League beyond like three teams. The Washington Nationals are on a four-game losing streak. The New York Mets are on a three-game winning streak. They are now tied with a 27-35 and record and three games out of a postseason spot. That's bad. That's really bad, okay? The Cubs and Padres are both under 500 and currently occupy the two wild card <laughs> spots. Okay, last year, I know it wasn't pretty last year, and that last spot it was like, oh, this isn't the most inspiring thing. So we already had this dynamic last year, but this just feels even worse. It is going to make it fun to follow. However, these are not good teams, and that is why it is in my bad. Is it a good thing? Probably not. Is it entertaining? <laughs> yes. Is it quality? Is it quality? 
definitively no. The Padres are uh, were swept by the Angels and then just lost last night to Arizona and they're still in wild card position. Awful. Okay, what's your bet? The Toronto Blue Jays in the first inning. Now, the Blue Jays did go out and take the last two games at home against the Orioles to avoid the mop. Starting to look a little bit better. Good wins for Toronto. They have not scored a first inning run since May 4th. It is June 7th. Okay, they have scored. Again, I'm just going to say that one more time. The Toronto Blue Jays have not scored a first inning run since May 4th. Well, and to June be clear, what, how significant is that? Um, because this is not a stat that most people are tracking. I believe the record is like 31 straight games, and they are now at 26. 20, they're, sniffing, they're sniffing yeah, it. They're heading, context, they're heading in that direction. The New York Yankees, who have the good fortune of batting Juan Soto and Aaron Judge in every first inning of every game, have scored 29 runs in the first inning over that same span that the Blue Jays have scored. Again, zero runs. Second place is the A's, who have only scored five runs. I just think it's hilarious because... All right, let's start the game and all right, second inning. <laughs> it's also That's indicative uh, that Bo Bichette and Vlad Jr. have just not they oh that just also means well, they haven't homered. Well, well, it is, but again, like they've changed up the lineup a few times too, right? Like they moved Springer out. It's mostly been Schneider and Jansen and, and Vlad and then Bo batting fourth. Um so yeah, no, it's just it's I agree. That's bad. Um by the way. Normally, when a team goes on a 14-game losing streak, they get mentioned in this uh, section. Yeah. But we'll talk about them next Friday when they're on a 20-game losing streak. All right. Uh, let's go to Ugla. Sorry, White Sox. Let's go to Ugla. Uh, well, why don't you... Oh, I'll, I'll do Ugla first. I actually hinted at this earlier this week about the Marlins and how the Marlins have just a hilarious number of left-handed pitchers. The Marlins lead baseball this year with 43 starts by a left-handed pitcher. The Angels are second with 37. There are three teams that have had zero left-handed starts this season. That is the Padres, the Twins, and the Mariners. That has actually happened 20 times uh, in base, 22 times uh, where a team has gone an entire season with zero left-handed starts. Most recently, Cleveland did it in 2018 and 2019. But I'm more curious about the Marlins side of things. What is the record for most starts by a left-handed pitcher in a single season? The answer is the 1983 Yankees, who had 127 starts by left-handed pitchers. The Marlins right now are only on pace for about 110, 112. So I don't think they're going to get there. But it is pretty amazing that that is where their rotation currently sits. I suppose if they trade Lizardo, they maybe will 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 get get away from that. But right now, with with Braxton Garrett and with Rogers and with Lizardo and with Weathers, <laughs> who's been great. And remember, Puck was in the rotation too briefly. So you know they are just as 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 lefty as it gets. So that is my ugla uh, this week. What is yours? With all those lefties on the Marlins, maybe Florida turns blue. J- Jordan got him. Uh, mine is very niche. Okay, on Tuesday. The Philadelphia Phillies won on a walk-off, okay, by Nicholas Castellanos. Bryce Harper was walked to start the bottom of the 10th inning, bringing up runners on first and second for Castellanos, who took the first pitch and laced it down the right field line for a walk-off double. A walk-off double. Jordan, Mm. why is that odd? So, it (sighs) let... Why is that odd? So is a walk-off double, they they ruled it a walk-off double is your point? It counted as a double. Nick Castellanos doubles on a sharp line drive. But he doesn't reach second base. Is that what you're He does reach to? second base. And he this does. is what I want to talk about. Okay. okay. Yes. When there yes. is a walk-off extra base hit that is not a home run, where the ball is hit deep to the gap or down the line where it's clear that it will yes. be a double. It is ruled a single most of the time when yes, the it is. run when the run scores before the hitter reaches, reaches. the base. Okay. Okay. So for instance, yes. if I'm hitting and you're on third and I hit one off the wall, you're going to reach home before I reach second. Yes. And so I am only going to get credit for a single even though in any other it. context for it sure. would be a double, right? For sure. 
in this, and you know, there's a million examples of this. I put one on the dock of Joey Meneses, you know, ripping mm-hmm. one down the line and like walking yeah. to first base. Okay. Mm-hmm. In this Castellanos play, it's super interesting because he's not really, I mean, he's he's running hard, but he gets to second before Whit Merrifield gets home. What's taking Whit so long? He's making sure that the ball is down. He's okay. making sure that the ball is not caught. And so you see Whit kind of like ease up as he goes towards home because there's not even a throw. And that allows Nick Castellanos to touch second base just before Whit Merrifield touches home. And so that is why double. Nick Castellanos has a walk-off double. I need what? to do a little bit more research into how rare these are because if you have a runner on second, they're probably not as rare, but they never would happen for a walk-off with a runner on third. Those are always going to get ruled a single. They're super, it's a super niche, super bizarre thing. But I just saw this and was like, Nick Castellanos, hey, walk-off double. That's a that's a great call. Listen, he's his slugging percentage needs all the help it can get. So I'm glad he got that extra base uh, to raise, you know, his slugs now up to 353, which is good. I, uh, yeah, this is, this is very interesting. I, I am, um, you know, we'll do some, some, some stat heading here, uh, after we get off, but this pod has gone on far too long. We'd like to keep it under an hour. Maybe people don't care. Maybe people will listen to us, um, you know, yeah, for three hours. If you would, that's very kind of you. Uh, let us know baseball barbecast that you well our producer wouldn't though so producer andrew hearts he has better things to do so we want to wrap this thing up he has some worrying about juan soto to go do so (laughs) we are going to let him go edit this podcast to do that uh jake any uh we look ahead to the weekend i guess briefly yeah yeah two weekend things one dodgers yankees the uh dream mlb world series preview if this is the world series that is both good for business and bad for for my mind considering how sticky it is to cover these two teams sometimes. But they'll be in the Bronx. I'll be there tonight. I am excited to see the circus. And then, oh, get in. <laughs> if you if you love James Ward-Prowse and Kurt Zuma and the Hammers and Mikhail, Pim- and Mikhail Antonio's clinical finishing in front of goal, and you also love Christian Pache, and Pache, Mark some of the Vientos. promotional materials, some of the promotional materials we've been getting for this from the Phillies and Mets social accounts. Uh, yes, Phillies, Mets, London, 1 p.m. Eastern on Saturday, 10 a.m. Eastern on Sunday. Little little breakfast ball there if you're here on this side of the pond. Obviously, these games are guaranteed to be weird. That is what is great about some of these international matchups. And uh, we got Ranger Suarez and Sean Manaya. We've got uh, Jose Quintana and Taiwan Walker. Taiwan Walker finding a way to pitch on Sunday once again, this time in London. And um, I, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and call it right now, Jake. Yeah. There are going to be a lot of runs scored on Sunday. A lot of runs scored on Sunday. I think Ranger will keep it in the yard on Saturday. And then Sunday's going to get messy. If I was too Capito Marcano, I'm hammering the over. Let me tell you that. Uh, London oh, Series. London Come Series on. will be great. <laughs> Come on, you Phillies. Come get on, it, you, Mets. you Mets. And again, this is another opportunity, right? Astros allegedly turning their season around in Mexico City. Can the Mets mm. really keep this hot streak alive? Yeah. Uh, probably not. All right, right, we're done. Uh, Jordan, you know that video that they keep, uh, the ad of Rob McElhenney, where he's in London, and it's like, Rob bringing these things together. Yeah. And there's the photo of the dad catching the ball with the beer. In Premier League games in London, and most sporting events in London, you can't drink beer at your seat. How about that? Not allowed to do that. Are you allowed to do that at the baseball game? I think so. And that's got to be a big calling card, a big point uh, of joy for british sports fans Hopefully come to the right. game yeah get on in there pack the house you know, tie one off <laughs> you know take the piss and watch a digger 
can are are they going to get to watch Whit Merrifield with some meat pies? That's my question. Can we can we enjoy ourselves with some? Anyway, okay, all right, we're done. We're done. Baseballbarbercast at gmail dot com. Keep those umpire villain nominees coming in. Those are making me laugh a lot. Thank you to Andrew Hartz for producing this longest episode of Baseball Barbercast, <laughs> and we will talk to you all next week. Make the Mets. Make the bets, come on down and great the bets. Bring your wife, bring your kids, get your come on, you bet, come on, bet, come on, bet. <laughs>